Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for turning out this evening. This, as I think we all know by now, is a very controversial issue. And we are, are scheduled to have a referendum on whether or not the cruise port and enhanced cargo port project proceeds on the 19th of December. So the government is making every effort to afford as much opportunity as possible to everyone to get the, uh, get the information and be educated about what it is that the government proposes to do and why it is that we propose to do it. We have with us this evening, as all previous evenings, a significant number of people who are involved with the project, experts, to be able to answer any of the technical questions that you may have about the project. I just want to, to make a, a few points. Um, you, will, you will understand from the presentations that are made, the video presentations as well as the, the oral ones, what the, the reasons behind building the port are. Why is it that government has decided to take this route? also explain the financial viability of the project. We will address the issues about the environmental impact of the project and also about the carrying capacity of the island. And also you will I think come to understand that we are truly at a crossword, crossroads with respect to the cruise industry. Things are evolving, constantly evolving, and evolving very quickly. The cruise companies are building or are ordering bigger and bigger ships to be built. And with ships that carry 6,000 plus passengers, the prospect of tendering is, is increasingly undesirable, unattractive, and indeed not viable. <coughs> we have now a very modern airport to greet the stayover visitors and all the rest of us who travel by air. But we are still dealing with cruise visitors who this year are estimated to number 1.9 million in the way that we or that countries dealt with this a hundred years ago. We've been in this business for about 50 years. Now we are the only jurisdiction in the Caribbean and Central America that still tenders passengers ashore. We have to ask ourselves whether or not we can expect to, to stay in the industry and not have a modern cruise port, which is comfortable, which is safe, which allows the persons who come here to visit to be able to disembark and embark the vessel safely, quickly, conveniently. So we hope to be, to be able to answer a number of those questions with this evening's presentation, following which we will be available to answer any questions that you have. I thank you all for attending. Those of you who are viewing this via our live stream, Thank you for joining. I will now direct your attention to the screen where we will be sharing two short videos with you, one on the court, on the port and the cargo facilities. I've been at the port from um, 1995. All these vessels keep on getting bigger. We are having more and more actually containers coming in. If you look at the figures from back from back in 2010, we actually had about 22,000 TEUs coming in, and at the end of actually 2018, we were up at actually 30,000. So this is a fairly large increase in only eight years. So if we continue with with that same actually trend, another eight years, 
we're going to be 35, 37 percent more, and we and we just do not have that space um, as it is now for us for us to keep on doing this. We cannot move all the containers that come in off of a vessel from the dock up to the cargo center within a single night. All of the increased volume, it just it is just not making it possible anymore. if you get some waves. I would prefer a dock to be freely go on and off this boat as I wish. Having a dock would be more convenient. Many long, long, long lines. I said it was very hot in the tender coming over, so it was it was very, it was, it was not fun. It was hot, but you know, dripping. It was just too hot coming across. I'm just gonna stay on this ship and avoid the chaos. Yeah. It just really cuts down your ability to be on the island longer. We've been with Norwegian many, many, many times, and we've never had this. There's no doubt about it. There needs to be a pier here. Well, the tendering is short. It's just that the lines are long, so the pier would be better. We've been in line for over half an hour, and it goes all the way back. You can't even see the end of the line, and we've been in it for half an hour. Last tender is supposed to be at 3. I would be in favor of the pier because it would eliminate these lines waiting for the tender ship boats to come. We've been standing here for a really long time. We had to tender in and it took us a really long time to get off the boat. So our excursions were supposed to start at 8. It took, we didn't get here until 9.30. I don't like to be tendered and I don't have to like to stand in this line like this, stand in this hot sun and it makes it easier. Because nobody stops for more than eight hours and you end up spending three hours doing the tendering process. So actually it would be advantageous for the community because they would make more money because people would be on the island longer instead of standing in lines. And now, it's again, it's the fact that we're supposed to be able to have a longer time and it's really shortening up our ability to spend more time on the island because now we're in this giant line to tender back. I've never had to wait in line like this for a tender, never. Well, we barely made our excursion, honestly. They said, we're glad you made it. <laughs> Walk off the ship and onto the dock. Yeah, that would be best. I'll now invite Mr. Russell Benford of Vi Verdant Isle to introduce his video, and he will also be doing a PowerPoint presentation at the end. Mr. Benford. Good evening, everyone. My name is Russell Benford. I'm with Royal Caribbean Cruises Limited. Uh, we'd like to start the presentation with a brief video. Thank you very much. This project really is about, in many ways, changing the model from an old model that's been in place for decades, ships coming to a destination. This project is about modernization and creating an adequate facility that allows the arrival of those tourists to come in an efficient way. Grand Cayman is a pretty efficient airport, and it manages efficiently through design and experience. All of the aircraft coming in, debarking, embarking, customs, immigration, all the procedures necessary, and it does it in an efficient way on a relatively small footprint. Today, in the arrival of the cruise ships, the ships arrive and they anchor in various locations around Georgetown. Tenders coming out to the ships, a long process to debark, and that's the process that we've got in place today for the cruise ship tourists. And that's approximately 1.8 million people. 600,000 air guests coming into a state-of-the-art airport. 1.8 million cruise tourists coming into fundamentally a model that was created 100 years ago. The group called Verdant is basically four companies, Royal Caribbean Cruises Limited, Carnival Corporation, Orion, and McAlpine two cruise companies and two companies very much involved in construction and building, particularly in the coastal marine environment. We believe the development of the cruise port facility will provide for additional economic impact opportunities for Grand Cayman. One, by the additional spend we believe that guests and crew will have by being alongside compared to tender operations. And two, more importantly, we believe the direct economic impact by having additional cruise arrivals to Grand Cayman will be significant. Having an enhanced welcome center arrivals, having berthing alongside are key components that we believe 
provide us the capability and the interest that we have in working with Grand Cayman. Today, the larger ships can't go to Grand Cayman. Uh, it's just simply not possible to manage the volume of tourists that are on the large ships. So it's really the nature of that product attracts a much more affluent customer, and we think that very much aligns with Grand Cayman itself. The project was the idea to upgrade both the cruise facility and the cargo berthing in Georgetown Grand Cayman. So we've been working with them to come up with the best design that basically increases the size of the cargo pier capacity, which is vitally important to the needs of the Cayman Islands. On the cruise side, in building two finger piers that are four berth oasis capable, you are increasing the size of the ships that can come into Grand Cayman. The consortium takes on entirely the risk of the project. We are designing it, building it, executing against this contract and we're funding and financing it and all of the funding and financing is the responsibility of the consortium. So there's effectively zero risk, zero responsibility to the government of Grand Cayman or the people of Grand Cayman. You know there's this whole conversation about it's going to cost people money. This is 100% financed by this consortium and it's paid back through head tax collected by the cruise line. I think we're all worried about the impact on the environment and our intention is to replace 10 times the coral that we've removed to create the facility. We brought in a specialized team that has worked in Grand Cayman named Polaris. They've done a lot of coral restoration including in Grand Cayman. The Grand Cayman results are 89% success rate since they've started. This is not a small project. It's going to take a number of months to move the corals. We have worked on several ship grounding cases here in Grand Cayman where we helped restore the reef. We feel like we're very qualified. We've worked on some really large projects and we have skilled scientists, engineers, and frankly, artists, because it really involves all three of those uh, aspects. It's not just a scientific endeavor. It's not an engineering endeavor. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's also an, an artistic endeavor. Our goal is to make a reef that looks like a reef, using all natural materials with healthy corals that lay people and even scientists after a period of time could not tell the difference. On this case, we've done this before. We've thought to go small and move reef sections individually with small boats to stay out of the port's way, have a number of boats working side by side, moving that over to the donor area. And then when we start moving corals over, our aim is to be out of the 10-acre dredge footprint area in about six months. For this project, we will be working on coral relocation as the part where we're taking out the direct impacts from where the dredging and the pier will be constructed. And then the other aspect, because we do know that there will be some loss due to coral relocation, we have decided to use this micro-fragmenting technique to increase overall coral cover within Grand Cayman and we think that that will increase it by 10 times. We're working with a group uh, led by Dr. Vaughan who's been at the forefront of advancing the coral micro-fragmenting planting technology. Grand Cayman has got a beautiful natural resource and they know they want to share that with the world. To do so we have to be able to help make sure the natural resources has all the help we can. And that is with technology. We have the technology now to put to good use in natural resource restoration. That's what this is. And we can make something beautiful. We have that technology. It'd be a shame to not apply it. Some of the biggest questions people had is, can we do this at scale? And so, we looked to start a project that was plant a million corals. Not only is it basically a good idea, it's our mission, it's our vision, and as I like to say sometimes, it's the recipe. Not only do we make many pieces, but each piece grows back to size in record time, which is very unusual. Our goal is no net loss on this project. We've engaged Dr. Vaughn to bring his research and knowledge to Grand Cayman. There's a lot of coral. We understand the impact to that. 
but our responsibility is to move that coral and to supplement that program with adding Dr. Vaughn's coral restoration process through microfragmentation. What's great about the microfragmentation technique and some of the other coral reskinning things that we do is we're able to see this actively happen before our very eyes. We can see it happen in a matter of months with each coral that we cut and plant. I've seen some of the damage that anchors from four to six cruise ships do per day out there for years. There's a lot of severe anchor damage out there and frankly, if that could be stopped in any way, that would be a positive. That is a big negative with the current situation where the ships drop anchors and the chains drag and the anchors drag and they've destroyed acres of coral. There's a benefit there, particularly in the long term because if you're not anchoring then the coral has the opportunity to recover and regenerate over time. I mean, obviously it's not overnight. So there is a positive there with the project. The project brings a number of positives. We'd like to work with the community down here in Grand Cayman. There's a lot of scientific expertise here. There's a lot of dive expertise here. We've worked with some of the members of the community in the past. We have uh, relationships with them and are looking forward to doing that again. All the techniques are proven. The survival has happened, a good survival. We've seen it right here in Grand Cayman. We can absolutely do it. It's just a matter of effort and a matter of doing it safely. What we look as an advantage of working for this project in the Cayman Islands is that there is a close partnership with uh, the DOE and the government uh, on making sure that this is a sustainable project. One of the first things we will do is get out and do what we're calling the coral gridding. We're basically just putting divers in the water and we'll be really mapping out almost by pretty much by hand all of the coral. The primary relocation area is approximately a, a little more than half a mile north of the project site and there we'll be placing large boulders on the bottom as a foundation or a substrate for the corals to be attached to so that we'll have new coral structures. Dredging the area of the port is not a contributor to the sand at Seven Mile Beach. Seven Mile Beach is what's known as a pocket beach and essentially the sand there is somewhat self-contained. And the port itself, that area, just is not a contributor of sediment to Seven Mile Beach. There's a total commitment to, to make this a, a, you know, a really great environmental success. We changed the way we're going to dredge the project. And initially we were looking at hydraulic dredging, but we changed the dredge process now to mechanical dredging. And we're going to have real-time sediment monitoring on the project. It's important that the pier is on pilings and not a filled structure extending from shore to allow waves and currents to move through the structure as if it's not even there. Because it's on piles, the changes to the hydrodynamics should be relatively minimal. We are undertaking everything we can within the framework of the port infrastructure and the guest and arrival welcome center. And we need to work very closely with the government of the Cayman Islands and the broader community to ensure that as these master plan enhancements for broader Grand Cayman and the roadworks and so forth are taken into account and ensuring that we can continue to deliver that experience as the port arrivals may grow over time. Our high season is the summer, from May through to October, and that's where we get higher paying customers and much higher yields. And it's extremely complementary with the Grand Cayman high season, which is in the winter. By allowing these ships to come into and berth in Grand Cayman, it effectively means that during the summer months, where today there's not a lot of tourists coming from the cruise ships, there will be more tourists coming from the cruise. For watching the video, and again, on behalf of uh, the Verdant Isle Group, our partners, I just want to welcome everyone here tonight. Honorable Premier, thank you for having us. I have a brief presentation to share with you tonight. A lot of the themes in the presentation were covered in the video, so I will kind of move quickly through some of the slides. And uh, most importantly, we want to get to the question and answer session so we can have a conversation about um, some of the things that you saw tonight. Again, the... Um, the cruise berthing and, and cargo enhancement project is a, is a Verdant Isle partnership. The partners are Royal Caribbean Cruises Limited, Carnival Corporation, Orion, and McAlpine. Uh, representatives from Orion and McAlpine are here tonight. So if you have questions about the construction, you can certainly ask. The project, again, just a, a brief recap. 
Um, in essence, we are uh, essentially going to build two cruise piers. Uh, we plan to increase the size of the cargo port by approximately 30%. Uh, also upgrade the tender facility. And uh, very important for, for the cruise passengers is we like to build a cruise guest arrival facility for those folks coming off the ships. This is a rendering that shows the proposed port and what it would look like. Um, it has the two finger piers. We show a uh, much larger cargo area and the, the uh, cruise arrival area as well as the parking area, staging area for the buses and taxis. Uh, the next couple slides will show some of what the f proposed facility would look like. This is the visitor arrival area. You can see uh, very wide pedestrian areas, nice retail shops and restaurants, um, and, and, and really a nice area for our guests to disembark the ship as they make their way onto Cayman Island. Um, again, we, we feel this, a pro this project is a win-win for everyone. Very important that there is a no financial risk to the government of the Cayman Islands or its people. The project is being financed by uh, the Verdon Group. We are borrowing the money to build the pier. Uh, the debt service for the pier will be repaid through head taxes. Every single cruise passenger that comes into the country pays a head tax. A portion of those, the fees collected, will go to pay the debt service. And another portion of the fees will be used to operate and maintain the facility as well as pay for the insurance, liability insurance on the project. So for 25 years, there will be no cost to the government or to the people of the Cayman Islands because the Verdon Group will be responsible for paying for this facility. In a case, God forbid, of some emergency, if there's a, a, a hurricane that hits and the pier is damaged, if there's a, some type of accident with a cruise ship and the piers need to be repaired, we would bear the cost of that not the government of the Cayman Islands. And then a really, really good story at the end is after 25 years, once we pay off the loan for the, for the uh, construction project, we will turn the project over to the government of Caymans and it will be owned by the people of the Cayman Islands in perpetuity. Um, this is a very important port point that I want to discuss because it's come up quite a bit in conversations. The control of the port would remain with the government and the port authority. Uh, the partners, again, Carnival Corporation, Royal Caribbean, Orion, McAlpine, will have no say in the operation of the port. We're not going to be able to decide which vendors operate and restaurants and, and, and shops. We're not going to decide on you know, which tour operators come onto the facility. That is all going to be operated and, and run by the government. The same people that run the port today will run the port in the future if this project is approved. Um, and in addition to that, all the birthing fees will be determined by the government, not by the partners. Um, and we think those, that's a very important point that we want to make is that the cruise lines are not going to control this facility. Another really nice elevation and illustration of what the visitor entry area is going to look like. You can see it has a lot of shading. If you remember the video, we show folks out in the sun. Uh, it can get hot here in the summertime, so we want to uh, build a very a uh, very nice and pleasant area so folks can get off. Uh, they can have some shade. They can have access to Wi-Fi. They can use restrooms, eat, you know, a nice meal. So this is, this is designed to entice folks to get people off of the ship and bring them onto the island in just a very, very nice setting where folks are comfortable and they feel happy. Again, another illustration of the uh, cargo port, 30% increase in the, in the size of that port is, I think, an incredible, um, something that's very important as you heard in the video, is, is we need room for the port area to grow, the cargo port area to grow. Uh, the next slide shows what the proposed um, um, facility looks like in the white. And if you look at the red outline, you'll see the original design of the pier. Um, based on feedback from the DOE, from residents, from folks that have been coming to those meetings, uh, we, we heard some of the feedback about the impact to the environment, and we wanted to try to do everything we could to reduce the footprint. So again, the, the outline in the red was the original um, layout of the port facility, and the white and grayish area shows you know, what we propose at this time, a lot less impact to the seabed, a lot smaller footprint, and we think it's a uh, much better design than the original, based on your feedback. Um, one of the benefits of having piers uh, and having this type of facility is that uh, the ships then tie up to a dock and you don't have a situation anymore where cruise ships are at anchor um, in, the, in the port area. And when the ships are at anchor, the large anchors are on the sea bottom, large steel chains. They really scour the seabed. 
destroy a lot of sea life. So um, when we build the port facility, you'll be able to tend to or be able to tie up four ships at a time. Uh, and at the very most, you may have two ships that are you know, at anchor and still using a tender facility, but a lot less ships at anchor and, and a, a, the impact to the seabed would be diminished. We are, um, and we have been, Royal Caribbean, the Verdon Group committed to sustainable environmental practices. We put together a wonderful team of experts, world-class experts, most of which are here today, that can really talk about the core relocation. We'll talk about the core re uh, restoration plans. Those are two different things. Restoration is different than the relocation project. Uh, we have experts that can talk about the silt management program. And finally, one of our recommendations from the partners was that uh, we establish an independent oversight group, a group of professionals that can take a look at the work that's going on out there during construction, after construction, long term, to give you all feedback from an independent group on the health of the environment, what's going on with the construction site, and someone who's independent of our, of our group. Uh, we have folks here tonight from Polaris who are here. Uh, sea Ventures, Reef Tech, and, and most of you in the room and, and streaming have probably heard of Plan a Million Corals project and Dr. David Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn is here tonight and um, really excited to answer your questions. This uh, group of partners, these experts that we put together have you know, worked on partner on these types of projects since 2005. From the Florida Keys to Puerto Rico and then most importantly they've actually done projects here in Grand Cayman that you can take a look at, you can touch it, you can, you know, see how that project is progressing. So you don't really have to rely on the statistics or what I tell you. You can actually look at what they've done here uh, in Grand Cayman. And this again is a list of some of the projects from 2005, six in Hawaii, all the way through 2018 in Puerto Rico. Dr. David Vaughn um, with the Plant a Million Corals project is a, a renowned um, scientist, coral scientist. He's, he's been really um, is the creator of a lot of cutting edge technology with respect to micro fragmenting technology. And uh, he is, again, he's, he's done this type of work all over the world, has been very successful. I think with each year, his success rate, uh, it climbs as the technology increases. And we're very lucky, very lucky to have Dr. David Vaughn as a part of our team. Uh, one of the things that I think the doctor is very excited about is that if this project is successful and we're allowed to move forward, Dr. Vaughn would like to create a demonstration facility right here in Grand Cayman so that he can actually demonstrate for you all and people watching, for our school children, actually how he grows coral, uh, be able to teach that technology and those methods to Caymanians in the hopes that you know young people, young professionals, entrepreneurs can maybe take an interest in this type of work and then be able to do these projects for themselves, hopefully join our team. Uh, we think it's a great technology for the future and it's something that people can learn right here in the Cayman Islands with Dr. Vaughn. Um, the next slide shows what his projects look like. I mean, it's, if you look at the very first slide, uh, he, he's taken one small fragment of coral and made nine pieces, the coin sized pieces of coral. Um, and that takes about a six, six months to grow them to the size of a, of a coin. Um, and he takes those pieces and attaches them to uh, cement boulders, essentially. And in the center picture, what you'll see is after about six months, what those eight pieces would look like, they grow to about the size of a softball, from a coin to a softball in about six months. And if you look at the slide all the way on the right, uh, those eight pieces that are shown in the center grow into a full coral head within one to two years. Um, so that's fantastic um, results, a really, really innovative tech technique that Dr. Vaughn has, has, has really created. Uh, and in the wild, that process that you see takes about, it could take anywhere from 25 to 75 years, depending on the environment. And uh, Dr. Vaughn and his group have been able to recreate that in about a two year setting. This is the a reef in Cancun that was damaged very badly after a storm. Just wanna show you if you could look at the actual seabed there and, and the absence of life. This is that very seabed um, after plantings, after restoration, three, five, and seven years, you can see a very healthy, diverse seabed, lots of different species of coral. One of the things Dr. Vaughn has, has been very good at is he's, he's been able to grow up to 28 different species of coral. So you see a very diverse seabed uh, that's full of life. 
The silt management program is something that our experts here tonight can talk a bit about if you have any questions about that as it relates to Seven Mile Beach and the health of some of the seabed. The, the, again, the excavation process uh, could you know, result in, in folks having questions about silt management, what happens to uh, silt and sand as you are actually excavating you know, the new pier facility. And we put together a really good plan of action. It has real-time silt monitoring technology that we plan to use. We're going to work very closely with the DOE, so every single day um, the, the, the folks here in the government in the DOE can really take a look at what we're doing and monitor what's going on with silt real time in our project. Again, we have, uh, we talk about the beach erosion impact study and, and we talked a bit about Seven Mile being a pocket beach and, and we have some illustrations that really show, you know, how water moves and how sand moves and, and we feel very confident as is shown in the 2015 EIA that this project will have no impact to Seven Mile Beach. Um, the next slide shows what the piers actually look like. This is sort of like an x-ray uh, x-ray of, of what a pier looks like. So um, the pier is really a concrete cap that's built uh, on top of a, a lot of piers, uh, or I'm sorry, a lot of piles. And so we, we, we drill a bunch of piles into the ground. The pier is sets on top of those. And uh, what, what this is illustrating is that water, sea life, moves in and around underneath the pier at all times. It's not a, a concrete dam that's going to be built in the port facility. So you'll see a lot of wildlife actually underneath these uh, facilities as well. Again, another illustration of what the new facility will look like. The two finger piers, an enhanced cargo facility, a very nice welcome center, and staging areas for taxis, buses, tour operators. So those folks are no longer going to be staging their vehicles along the street, congesting traffic downtown. You'll see those cars in this facility. And it's a nice facility, again, for the taxi drivers and the tour bus operators. Well, they have restroom facilities. They can use Wi-Fi. They can have a nice lunch. Um, everybody's it, that we need to sort of think about, either on the cargo side or the crew side, we, we are planning facilities to just make it a better experience for the folks that are visiting and for the people who work there. With respect to the economic impact of the project, we anticipate roughly 200 construction jobs. You know, masons, laborers, concrete workers, welders, electricians, those are um, jobs that would start if the project is approved uh, very soon. So we're very excited about that. And then we think uh, very important that uh, the economic impact to the Cayman Islands and, and to the people who live here would, would be great. These are, are jobs that, you know, people here we, we would we'd love to have Caymanians work in these jobs. Up to 500 new tourism sector jobs, tour operators, uh, just the whole gamut of the, of the tourism uh, sector jobs. And, and in one of the previous meetings, the Premier talked about, you know, how really the, the cruise industry is, is something that is really the interaction between uh, entrepreneurs here in the Cayman Islands and small business owners is really strong. And that's really a foothold that you have. And this is an opportunity to grow that by about 500 new opportunities in the tourism sector. sector. And we talked about in the slide or in the video that we expect if this project is approved and the pier is built, we would increase, increase the number of cruise passengers from 1.9 million today to about 2.5 per year. That represents a 30% increase. But the thing in the video that I want to stress again is the bulk of cruise passengers, our guests that sail on big ships, our peak season is in the summer months. So what you look at, that 30% increase would really be absorbed in the summer months. So where now you have this bell-shaped curve of tourism where a lot of folks come in the winter and then the summer months are dead, what you'll see is more of a flattening of that. So we don't expect any increase in, in the number of guests you have on a, on a peak day, but what, what you will see is a lot more guests that visit in the summer. So between the months of May and October, the big ships come. We bring a lot of, of, of our guests and a lot of economic opportunity during those months. Um, again, as I mentioned, the, 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 the traffic study that the government is working on in Georgetown, we are um, collaborating with, and we want to make sure that when we, we design this facility that we really understand what, what, what the traffic patterns are in Georgetown and, and how our plan for a, a facility can improve and take a lot of that traffic off of the streets and provide nice parking and staging areas uh, for our tour operators and for taxi drivers. Again, as uh, you saw in the video, and Michael Bailey pointed out, we, we survey our guests, we understand the demographics of our guests, and with respect to the large cruise ships, what our data has shown 
is that the folks who purchase cruises, who sail on the large Oasis class ships, their per family income is, is roughly 20% more than the folks who sail on the other ships. So what that means is the Oasis ships bring more guests, they bring higher paying guests, and they bring guests who spend a lot more money once they come onto, uh, into a country and possibly into Cayman, hopefully into Cayman. In 2018, uh, the cruise industry's economic impact was about $240 million here in the Cayman Islands. If this project moves forward and is built, we anticipate that that um, economic impact would increase to $340 million a year. So about a $100 million increase in economic, uh, economic impact from this, uh, this project. Folks have asked the question, if this project is approved on December 19th, what happens next? Do you start to see the dredging in, in the, right the next day? And the answer is no, we have a lot more work to do. We're really at the beginning. Uh, we responded to um, you know, what the government has asked for so far to come up with, with a concept of what we want to do. But if the project moves forward, then we really get into the nuts and bolts of um, the design, the, 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 how the, the contracts would work. So it's going to take us quite a bit of time you know, after December 19th if the project is, is approved. But we would like to begin construction in 2020 if possible and finish construction by 2022 so that we can begin to 2023 so that we can be, begin to bring the large ships um, again we are very happy and thank you all for coming out tonight especially on a saturday uh, we know it's just important for you all you have things to do and um but we're really thankful for the opportunity i'm going to introduce uh, one of my colleagues barry Loudermilk is here uh, he's uh, he and his team and, and the group that's sitting in the front of the room are going to answer a lot of your technical questions tonight. So we look forward to it. And again, thank you very much for your time. Barry. Good evening, folks. Premier, thank you. Russell, thank you for the introduction. Uh, tonight, I want to talk a little bit about our team. Uh, there's been, in the past week or so, there's been a lot of misrepresentation of the team and who our coral specialists are. So I want to introduce uh, Planet and Corals, Dr. Vaughn, and Greg Challenger with Polaris. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that everyone in the community and streaming live can understand the differences between these two companies. Dr. David Vaughn's Plant a Million Corals is basically brought on to this project to deliver a restoration program that will take place once or as the coral is being moved and progresses on for the next 25 years. Um, this is a program funded 100% by this consortium. It was not a mandate through the bidding process. This is what I frankly call a gift that we're giving back to Cayman through a technology that we completely believe in. Uh, there's, there's results behind it. Uh, every, all the evidence, this is going to work. Uh, Greg Challenger with Polaris and his team with Sea Ventures and Reef Tech. These guys are our coral relocation specialists. What does that mean? That means that Greg is going to be the first guy on the job uh, and his team. And they're going to move all the coral to its permanent resting site um, that we shown on the video which were two locations about a kilometer north and one a little bit further up north so there's there's a difference between these two and i think uh, unfortunately dr vaughn has been taking the brunt of uh, being the coral specialist uh, our coral he is our coral relo he's our coral restoration specialist greg challenger uh, with polaris is a scientist um, I'm going to let these guys tell a little bit of their story, but um, there, there is a difference between the two and there's a complete separation. So when addressing any questions as it relates to coral, we'd really appreciate if you address it, whether it's a coral restoration or a coral relocation question, and we're going to get the right answer from Greg or Dr. Vaughn. So with that, I want to bring both of these gentlemen up. I'd love for you guys to tell a little bit about yourself and get the community aware of who you are and what you do. All right, thank you. Thank you. As, as Barry said, uh, my name is Greg Challenger and I am a president of a small company of scientists. Uh, we have nine scientists on our team. 
chemical oceanographers, physical oceanographers, marine ecologists. And what we do is we assemble uh, larger teams in basically in disasters that occur around the world. Our team has worked on the largest oil spills and ship groundings on coral reefs that have destroyed coral reefs basically in the world. Um, and it's not just me and Polaris, it's we've worked uh, in a lot of parts of the world with a lot of different scientists and over the years, uh, my, my academic background, just to back up a second, is, is from Florida. Uh, I went to Florida Atlantic University and Florida Institute of Technology for my graduate work. I taught marine ecology down in the Florida Keys, a little place called Newfound Harbor Marine Institute for a number of years. And I taught also for the School for Field Studies in uh, South Caicos and the Turks and Caicos Islands and on uh, board the Semester at Sea for Sea Education Association, um, both of those affiliated with Boston University. And I also worked with the government with the U.S. National Marine Fisheries Service up in the Gulf of Alaska and North Pacific, and I was in a little place called the Prince William Sound in 1989 when the Exxon Valdez happened. And since that time, uh, we've sort of gone down that road of uh, assembling teams in, in big disasters to do the seemingly impossible. And we've worked on, I'm not really sure how many uh, large vessels that have hit ship, uh, that have hit coral reefs, unfortunately it happens. Uh, more often than the public thinks, and, and, and too often. Uh, but, uh, and our job is to reconstruct the reef. Uh, we, we call this coral relocation here a lot, but we're really doing a, we're, we're reconstructing a reef and relocating coral. And it's uh, really kind of similar to a ship grounding, except the ship hasn't smashed the reef, we get to do it much more carefully. And uh, w though we've had a lot of success putting uh, back together damaged reef sites, uh, a lot of uh, good survival right here in, in Grand Cayman. Um, we have an opportunity to, uh, to not have a ship crush all the corals and have much more corals available and get better, uh, better survival uh, in these areas. So we look forward also to, I know Barry said we'll be working, uh, we're, we're working separately, but I, I will be making some fragments for, uh, for Dr. Vaughn to work with. And certainly I, I've, said, I've said I too much because uh, it's not me. Uh, in our company, we have a team of, of really good scientists who've done a lot of this work and handled a lot of corals underwater and moved it. But with our, our uh, partners from Puerto Rico, uh, who we've worked on with the United States government, um, they're a contractor for the United States government. They've reattached tens of thousands of corals after hurricanes. Uh, we worked on a half a dozen uh, reconstruction jobs of some very large ships crashing into reefs like a uh, a 300 foot LNG carrier, I'm sorry, 900 feet, 300 meters. Um, and so some really, really large devastating projects. And uh, in this opportunity, you know, this again, this is an opportunity where we have a chance to do it a little more carefully. Uh, and so uh, we, we look forward to being able to do that successfully. We have never not met with success on a project. Our, uh, we did the Paul Allen uh, anchor damage here on West Bay and also a cargo ship ran aground at Eden Rock. Uh, and as Barry said, you know, please ask, and, and we'll uh, we'll show examples. We'll be happy to talk about our, our other team members. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Hudson, I met in the late, in the late '80s. Uh, he's a marvel of of uh, of, of a person. Uh, he's known internationally as the Reef Doctor, and he worked for uh, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And he was sort of the founder of putting reefs back together that had been damaged uh, in ships and hurricanes. He's got over 100, 150 publications. He's a geologist uh, uh, in, in matters related to reef geology and reef reconstruction. And he's, uh, he's great to have as an advisor on the team and to run everything by. And he's in his 80s and he's in the water cementing and hammering. And uh, he's, he's really an amazing person and we're really looking forward to having him as, a, as one of our advisors on the team. I've worked on projects with him from Hawaii uh, in the South Pacific and uh, Florida and the Caribbean as well. So we have, and there are some other people uh, to be named that uh, are, uh, are going to be on the team should the project be approved, <clears throat> that have a, a lot of experience as well. And uh, so our team is really, uh, I, I can say safely that this team that is assembled has reconstructed more coral reefs from large ship groundings than any team out there. Um, I feel 100% confident in saying that. And, and we really look forward to working with Dr. Vaughn and, uh, and helping him outplant some of the corals he grows and giving him some fragments to work with. And uh, we look forward to that. <clears throat> Thank you very much.
Thanks, Greg, and it's my pleasure to be able to tell you just a little bit of history about myself. I really look at myself as a, a marine aquaculture specialist who has worked with maybe uh, corals for 20 years. And in fact, yeah, you can look up at my age and now try to figure out that my f actually very first uh, coral expedition was in 1966. So it's not one where I, you know, must have been only a couple of years old when I did that. But that was actually for the, um, um, to look and and uh, find the location for the West Indies Laboratory in St. Croix, Virgin Islands. And I have to tell you, back in 1966, my job was to actually take pieces of live coral, put them into a jar to send back to the university. At that time, that was a, an okay thing. And as I'm telling people now, I'm making up by the thousands for those few corals that uh, I collected for the scientists back in 1966. Regretfully, that lab, uh, Hurricane Hugo, um, eliminated it. But also, I want to tell you another couple of little story histories is that I did my senior coral project right here in Grand Cayman in 1975. I spent a month and a half on this island going around to all the other coasts. It was, seemed to be a lot less cars then for some reason. And um, my job was to uh, identify some of the hard corals, soft corals, and macroalgae for the island. And so it was m one of my first introductions to, uh, again, a very beautiful place, very beautiful island. And I spent the rest of my life actually looking at technologies to uh, be applied. I'm, I'm not a basic scientist that sits in a laboratory and looks at one little part. Uh, I wanted to actually learn to be productive in an applied science that was able to actually do something out there. So a lot of my experience is experience of hands-on. And those hands-on experience included producing some of the largest uh, jobs for production of millions of corals, in fact, billions of corals, and thousands of oysters, and shrimp in, in sustainable recirculating systems. And I ended up in 1995 uh, starting a project where we produced actually thousands of corals for the aquarium trade. It is a company called ORA, Oceans, Reefs, and Aquariums. It's the largest in the world. And we produced 100,000 corals for the people that used to take corals out of the Pacific Ocean for their, their reef tanks in their house. And I thought it was a great purpose until um, one of my now good friends, Philippe Cousteau, came up to me and said, why are you doing this for the aquarium trade? You should be doing this for the reef. And I literally quit my job at the, one of the second largest uh, oceanographic institutes where I was the director of aquaculture for 17 years and started working uh, at the th third largest oceanographic institute, Moat Marine Lab, as their director of coral reef restoration. Uh, and for the past 15 years, I've developed some of them by accident, some of these techniques that are able to grow corals, that's a game changer for corals. And I'm real proud to say that instead of retiring last year, I decided that I wanted to continue and show the world in places that are dear to my heart of how they can help save coral reefs. And when I heard after the fact of what was taking place here that I could be maybe added on by showing some of the local people here that are already working on some coral restoration of the staghorn corals and others, that I may be able to have an opportunity to come here and, and uh, share uh, with the local experts that are here, the people that are already doing as divers, and maybe make a program to grow more than just the staghorn corals, but the big elkhorn corals again, and the other 28 species that make the reef the mass of corals. So I'm here to uh, help. I'm not here to take anybody else's job. I want to work with the locals here that are divers and are scientists, that are volunteers. I hope to be able to build a, an effort that's an educational demonstration for not just the school children here, but for those two million people that come here. Could be like the Turtle Center, a demonstration to show people how you've done so well with turtle conservation. I was so pleased just to, and blessed, two years ago, I was nominated as a conservationist of the year for 2017. And I hope to do that to not just retire and go away, but to help 
people in islands like Grand Cayman to restore their corals for the future. Hence the name uh, Plant a Million Corals, a nonprofit foundation that just started up to be able to help people around the world to do this. Thank you. Thank you so much. It brings us to the time where we have our question and answer segment. And for those of you uh, who came in after we got started, you, when you entered, you were given a magazine, a flyer, and a pen with a nice piece of paper. There will not be a room in mic, so any questions you may have, we ask you to complete the form and raise your hand, and those questions will be collected by those persons who are walking the floor. Our first question. How will we spread 20,000 visitors around the island to not overfill our attractions? Good evening, everyone. The, the beauty of having the piers, as was pointed out in one of the videos and in Russell's presentation, is that we will be able to take advantage of the fact that the cruise industry in this region, their peak season is from May to October, which is the slow season for our stayover tourism. Currently, we don't get anywhere near the number of ships and consequently the number of visitors in, the, in those months, and many of the businesses, tour operators, taxi drivers, and others really struggle to make it during, those, during that slow period. And the reason for that is, as was indicated by both Russell and the video, is the big ships that carry 6,000 plus passengers do not tender. And therefore, even though there are three Oasis class vessels in the Caribbean, Caribbean during the summer, none of them stop in Cayman. With the pairs, they'll be able to stop. And so even though the, the overall increase will be significant, the projected increase from about 1.9 million to about 2.5 million, the actual number of passengers here on any given day will not increase. The Port Authority is in charge of the itinerary we can dictate through them the number of passengers, the maximum number of passengers we are prepared to accept in, on any given day. But what we will have now is a much more consistent throughput of passengers so that the 2.5 million won't make any difference to the overall carrying capacity of the island not increase the strain at all, but instead of having really, really slow days, really, really slow weeks and months, we will be able to have a much more consistent um, throughput of passengers over the course of the year. Thank you. Can Dr. Vaughn and Polaris tell us where they have worked successfully? Testing, can you hear me? Okay, well, I'll tell you maybe from the present and, and backwards. Um, presently, um, I'm working for the, uh, and have been for the past year with the Nature Conservancy on five of their coral hub islands uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, just got back uh, last week from the Cape Eleuthera um, Environmental Institute as well as the Cape Eleuthera uh, School um, the other location is Grenada with the Nature Conservancy, a project there called At the Water's Edge, where instead of building uh, gray uh, cement structures to stop the uh, waves from eroding, uh, we are trying to make something that's a little more natural, a little more uh, rough, just like seawall softening. We're actually using something with more of a rubble and we're planting corals on it so it's a natural reef being produced. 
with the Nature Conservancy in St. Croix um, at uh, their hub there for production of uh, uh, 25 to 30,000 uh, coral a year microfragmentation laboratory. Uh, next month I start in uh, U.S. Virgin Islands St. Thomas where we're building a water system for a land-based student system so they can be trained on uh, aquaculture. Worked in Cancun for the past three to 15 years on the uh, Manchones reefs with the uh, Cancun Marine Protected Area and the Mexico uh, Institute of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Uh, let's see, that's just the past really two or so years. Um, but 15 years as the executive director of Moat Marine Labs uh, uh, International Center for Coral Reef Research and Restoration. Okay, so we've, uh, uh, coral restoration projects around here, our projects in Grand Cayman uh, were very successful. We worked with the DOE and we have, uh, we had a number of local people on our staff too, some really uh, skilled divers. Uh, and those projects were the, the reconstruction of the reef was extremely successful, as Barry mentioned, with high survival. I've done I don't know how many cases in South Florida, um, uh, working with the NOAA's Southeast Center, the Coral Restoration people, Dr. Sean Griffin and Tom Moore could speak to the success of our projects in Florida. Also with the Florida DEP in Broward County, I've probably, we've probably done half a dozen to 10 anchor damage and hull damage uh, uh, coral reconstruction cases. A case in Hawaii with uh, Dr. Harold Hudson, 15 acres, was hit by a large cement ship. Uh, we attached a lot of corals. The success there actually outdid the natural corals because it's a big wave environment. And the, big, the shear force of the waves has the corals on the area have a hard time uh, gaining a foothold. But after a number of years, only the cemented corals were still there, several thousand of them. Uh, we've relocated corals also in Cancun. Um, we've uh, moved a lot of uh, Elkhorn corals because there was a ship aground and the only way to get it out would have damaged these corals, so we put them somewhere else safely and that was, uh, that was a success. <clears throat> the British Virgin Islands, uh, right near the uh, ship ran aground right near the wreck of the Rhone. Uh, we did the restoration there. Uh, the St. Thomas, uh, uh, St. Croix, um, uh, more than a half a dozen cases in southern Puerto Rico uh, with Sea Ventures of reef reconstruction. So I'm not, I'm not really sure of the number, but uh, we've been uh, uh, getting better over the years, and I think our Eden Rock case is, re is really a showcase. I, I think the, the, uh, the success down here is a really good indicator. And so we've, uh, uh, in, in some of our other projects too, we've, uh, you know, we, were the, we put together the team for the shoreline response on the Deepwater Horizon. Um, we've worked for the World Bank and the UN uh, assessing to the, restore the shorelines after the Iraq War. Uh, and I just came here from the Grand Bahama where we're working to restore the forest affected by the oil spill uh, in the hurricane, putting together a team for that as well. So uh, uh, not just coral reefs in the tropical environment, but uh, we, we handle some other big things as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Given enough time in my age, uh, I remembered a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> so um, actually, uh, just uh, three months ago, finished uh, a fairly large uh, uh, operation also in Grand Bahama, um, Coral Vita operation it's called. Uh, two early students from a number of years ago successfully now, we, we, I helped to build and design a system for about 35,000 coral production per year. Uh, regretfully, on Grand Bahama, it's gonna take a few months to rebuild those uh, back up. And But probably one of the bigger Two programs I've been involved in is one is Fragments of Hope in Belize, and Belize has done a great job with fishermen and replanting so many staghorn and elkhorns in that southern area, Placencia, uh, is that they're considering taking one of those off the endangered species list for for that region. It's a it's a very um, now prolific area. That kind of things of a grassroots up one worked very uh, uh, well in that area. Thank you. Premier, please explain your red line statement on Seven Mile Beach. That is a real concern for those of us still undecided. Thank you for the question. What I've said, and the, the VIP, 
IP, the Warden IL, uh, VIPP, the Warden Airport Partners as well, no one agree that if, if there is any evidence at all, any concern at all, that this project would in any way impact the Seven Mile Beach, that is the end of the idea, regardless of how far we've gone or how much we've spent. That's the red line. That's always been the red line. But all, all of the indications are, all the evidence is, the environmental impact assessment said clearly that the West Bay, the, the, the West Bay area, the Seven Mile Beach, is not at all impacted by this project because of the way uh, the sedimentation moves. So that is the red line, and has always been the red line. How much coral is actually being affected? I have seen everything from one acre to 30 plus acres. How much coral is actually being affected? I think if you look in your um, magazines, there's a, a couple of good uh, kind of displays there, but to give you an idea, there's 30 acres that are impacted by the potential of, of what is in that whole area. Um, there is in that area about 10 acres of what's classified as coral and coral uh, hard bottom. Of that, about half of it, about five or so acres, five or six, is some uh, fairly nice coral uh, areas. The, the other four to five is uh, ones where that hard bottom is considered to be uh, just that, a hard compressed aragonite calcite type bottom um, with a coral here and there. So it's, it's really all of those numbers. <laughs> and so it's not 30 acres of corals being damaged, it's not even 10 acres of corals are being killed, it's 10 acres that have corals being moved, five of which of those are some pretty nice corals. And, uh, uh, we all realize that it, that is an environmental issue, and that's why all of these pieces and parts of trying to, to move them, keep them, and add more in the following years uh, has been made known. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. Is it true that the cruise ships will be bringing their own buses and taxis and will stop using local ones? Absolutely not. <laughs> And I could, if, speaking on behalf of Royal Caribbean, that is, that is not true. We actually don't own <laughs> taxis and, no, it's not true. How do we justify this project when Oasis class ships are in short supply? Only three in the Caribbean. I, um, just really quickly, the Oasis class ships right now, Royal Caribbean has four of those Oasis class ships um, that are operating you know, here in the Caribbean. Uh, the Oasis class ships operate in the Caribbean. We have several on order uh, for uh, the Caribbean in the next decade. The next class of ship for Royal Caribbean will be called the um, Icon, which will be roughly the size of an Oasis class ship, maybe a bit larger. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of Carnival Corporation, but they are large ships that are I think there's a depiction of one and a picture behind uh, the moderator. Uh, their XO class ship is an Oasis size ship. Uh, they have several on order for the next 10 years. So um, what we're looking at is in the next decade, uh, the cruise market will be dominated by the entry of new Oasis class size ships to the marketplace. That is the, the future trend of cruising is uh, at least for Royal Caribbean and for Carnival is large Oasis class ships. A building contractor can build a 1,000 or 5,000 5, square feet house. The size doesn't matter. It's the method that counts. Is the same for true for coral relocation? That was a really good question. Somebody's pretty smart out there. Uh, no, it, it is. It absolutely is. I know there's been a lot of talk. This is a really large project. Have you ever done uh, you know, a project this large? Well, if you put a few of our projects side by side, the answer would be yes. And so the method is, is you, you start out in one spot, 
and you do what you did 20 times before and then you do it again and you just have to do it a few more times you build the if we're building 90 houses instead of one you build the last one just like you built the first one and if you have people that know how to build the first one well then the last one should be built well as well thank you I, I think there's a follow-up is it the method that counts rather than the size of the project it is absolutely the method that counts um, it's it's uh, handling the corals, knowing where they like, they prefer to live on the reef. Not all the species live in the exact same places. Um, and the, the methods of attachment that are proven and successful, and the people that have done it many times in the water. So uh, those things, those elements come together and uh, um, it, will, uh, it will work. Thank you. What is going to happen with the traffic in Georgetown? going to get worse lunchtime? Actually, if, even if we didn't do what we're doing and have been doing in terms of trying to improve the, the, the circulation there by putting in a whole range of, of new roads, it would still get better with this, with this project because, as you will see, we will move all of the parking of the minivans, all the loading and discharging of them off the main road and onto the, onto the birthing site. But we're not just um, depending on that. We are, have been engaged now for about six years in a revitalization project for Georgetown and a, a, an ongoing project aimed at improving the, the road system and increasing the capacity of the road system. So these things combined, we sh despite the projected increase in passengers, we should actually see a significant improvement in, in traffic flow, not just in Georgetown, but more generally, because a big part of the, of the idea is that the ships will be able to stay here longer. People will be able to disembark and embark easier and therefore have more time to be able to, to be to take advantage of tours to the eastern districts in particular, which largely miss out on any of the cruise ship business. Premier, you stated that the government has spent nine million on reports and studies over the last six years. In your opinion, was that money well spent to give our people credible advice? Indeed. As I have said to people time and time again, this is not some just um, impulsive project of ours. We campaigned through two election cycles, 2013 and 2017, on the basis that we would build a cruise port and enhance the cargo port. And much of the work was done during the previous term to take us to this point. We have engaged top of the class experts in, in every area to advise us right along the way. This project at initially was under the auspices of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office because when I took office as Premier, the government financial situation was not good and we were in breach of the principles of, of, uh, that, that the UK government insists upon that are settled in our public management and finance law and therefore we had to get UK approval for every budget and for any project which would would cost money. So we are, perhaps if we hadn't had such a, a rigorous um, process in place, prudential process in place, we would have started building this a long time ago. I'm not, I'm not at all um, sorry that, that, um, that we didn't do that. I, I think that the Cayman Islands deserves the very best. This is a major project. It's gonna have long-term impact and we needed to do everything we could to get it right. I think we have done everything absolutely by the book. In fact, above what would normally be acceptable standards because we want to ensure, and we still want to ensure that we deliver the very best for Cayman for the long-term. We are not against the cruise or cargo port 
birthing facility. It's the location, Georgetown Harbor, that we do not want destroyed. Why not put both of the above at Pedro Castle, where the water is very deep, we would no longer have to worry about destroying our own God-given natural coral reefs and very clean, clear salt water. This would be a win-win for everyone living together in these islands. Well, we are not proposing to destroy Georgetown Harbor. I think we, we've just had an explanation that the area that is going to be directly impacted by the construction of the piers is about 10 acres five acres of which is is coral and the other five acres what we call hard bottom. There will no doubt ob obviously be other impacts as well. None of us are downplaying or trying to deny that this project is going to have some negative environmental impact. There's a trade-off for everything. What we have determined is that trade-off that, that we are making is right, and that the economic impact significantly outweighs the loss of of the of the coral, which will will be affected. In addition, you've just heard Dr. Vaughan, the gentleman from Polaris, and others explain what is being done to mitigate that, and the efforts which will be made to restore and replace and are not replace, relocate the coral. As long as Cayman has been settled, the harbor has been in Georgetown. There's a reason why those old people decided that's where it should be. It's on the lee side of the island. It's got deep water. We don't have the benefit of really protected harbors like they are in some other places in, in the Caribbean and in, and in the world. But that's where the harbor has been. Out there has been impacted over many years by anchoring, and particularly over the last 50 years since we've had um, cruise ships visiting with the anchors going overboard. There's been massive damage to the sea bottom out there already. In addition, over the course of those 50 years, the, the duty-free um, stores and, and businesses have all developed in that area designed to accommodate and facilitate cruise visitors. If we try to put it somewhere else, if you think we have trouble trying to get it built down there, you tell the people in Savannah that you're going to put a, a massive cruise facility up at the end of um, up, up Pedro Castle Road and see what sort of response you get. In, addi in addition, that is not the lee side of the island. You would have to do, I'm no expert, but I've lived here all my life. You'd have to do significant work um, in terms of breakwaters and so forth to be able to, to deal with, with that because it is rough on that side of the island more than it is smooth. So. Many attempts, someone sent me something this, this morning showing a proposed um, port and cruise port in the North Sound years ago. Uh, that's been contemplated for longer than I've been alive, um, actually. But that would be massive, massive dredging. The average depth of the North Sound is 12 feet. You'd have to breach the reef. I've heard proposals about putting it Red Bay or South Sound. Can you imagine the response of all the people, the wealthy people who have built homes in that area? The, the truth of the matter is that there really is no other place to put it than where it has been for, where the harbor has been for nigh on 300 years, Georgetown. If the referendum results does not reject the project, what key activities will get underway and what will be achieved by 17th January 2020? Mm -hmm. 17th January 2020. Nothing. <laughs> If, 
is it true, as is posted on Facebook, that work has already been started on building a laboratory? Absolutely not. Can you explain the EIA scoping document and also the role of the Department of Environment? Hi everyone, uh, Peter Ranger, Chief Project Manager at Public Works. So the EIA scoping document that's currently getting produced by Verdant Isle is really looking at the difference between the design from the 2015 EIA to the current proposal. There's been meetings held with DOE. They're pulling that document together. It's going to be finished early December. And what that's really doing is looking at the difference between two schemes. At that point, it will go to DOE EAB for approval, and they'll give us the next steps. But I think, a, as what happened in previous meetings, a, we're telling the public to make this project go ahead, there's going to be a coastal works permit. And for that coastal works permit, there's a lot of work which will be happening next year in terms of a coral relocation plan, a dredge management plan, an environmental management plan, to bridge the thresholds we put, water quality thresholds we put. So it's not like if there's a yes on the 20th of December, suddenly work start. There's a lot of preparation work, and Greg probably won't be getting into the water till probably the third quarter of next year, or thereabouts. Yeah. Sorry, Peter, could you um, perhaps explain that the, the footprint of the project has been Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so in the comparison, already we know from Verdant's bid that the, uh, basically the, uh, the dredge volumes have reduced by 30%. The dredge footprint has reduced by 10%. And the impacts have significantly reduced overall from 2015. Uh, at one point, we were looking at dredging Hogstai Bay to facilitate the cargo yard. And we gave it up because, again, it was a potential impact. And if you look at the schemes, uh, back in 2015, the government could have moved ahead from the EIA, but they didn't. We went ahead and we appointed Royal Hill Schooling and spent a third of a year trying to enhance that scheme and then the impacts. So what we can say here is the scheme that's currently up there has been enhanced and squeezed and appears to moved as far as they can into deeper water, the dredge footprint narrowed as much as possible, the reclamation area squeezed as much as possible, and that is the fully enhanced scheme that is taking a long time to get to. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Peter, could you also explain a little bit about about the dredging and and the degree of dredging involved in Yeah, so if you look at the uh the green on the picture there, we've seen a lot of the uh reports about thirty feet of dredging, sixty feet of dredging. But basically the, the dredging's to eleven meters, thirty six feet. And uh, at the current wall of the Georgetown Harbour, we've got 16 feet of water. So the maximum depth of dredge is only 20 feet. As it goes further out, it tapers off to zero. So it's not like there's a 30, 40 foot hole in the ocean. The deepest part is only 20 feet. Okay. Are the Verdant Isle spokesmen who are attending these meetings being paid? And or was that included in some of the contracts with them? No, we're not getting paid. If we put the berthing facilities outside of Georgetown, wouldn't the cruise ship passengers have a choice of bus transportation, taxi, tenders, to and from Georgetown, or maybe even to the Turtle Center? Possibly, but I've, I've explained, I think, um, in some detail why Putting it somewhere else in Georgetown is simply not viable. This is not a question. It's more a statement. But for transparency, I will read it. 4,600 jobs depend on cruise tourism out of a small population is a lot. And the impact to the environment is sad. But our people can't eat coral. We need to help people first, coral after. That concludes the questions that I have taken from the floor this evening. Are there any other questions? Well, I want to thank all of you for attending this evening, and unless our Premier has any closing words. Um, no, I, I just want to thank you uh, who have come, come out this evening.
for the meeting. I uh, we have another meeting in in Bordentown on uh, the 26th on Tuesday. The, on the 26th, one in Northside and one in East End, before we conclude the round of of meetings. But uh, I urge you all to to pay attention to to what is being said, and if there are issues or concerns, please try to seek out the facts. Uh, go to the government uh, website where the, where the facts are. We are uploading, uploaded and are con continuously uploading all of the information that is available with respect to this project. There is a massive amount of misinformation out there, as we heard some of it tonight, uh, aimed at simply creating fear and concern and having people um, vote against the project. Whatever uh, folk decide to do is a matter for them. Uh, the government will be bound by whatever the decision is. But it is important, I think, that you make your decision based on facts and not um, fear mongering and misinformation. Again, thank you all for coming and good night. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's supportertourism.com, the website, supportertourism.com. And again, just a matter to repeat, Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. we'll be at Bodentown Civic Center. December 3rd, we will be at East End Civic Center. Thursday, December 5th, Northside Civic Center. And on the 6th of December, which is the Friday, we'll be in Cayman Brack. Along with your magazine given to you as you entered, there was also a flyer. That's actually a consolidated version of the magazine. So we again encourage you to log on to our, our website, supportourtourism.com, and check our F&Q section there. Uh, there's all the information you want will be posted there. Thank you again. Please partake with the of the refreshments to the back and have a good evening. <laughs>